you have your Bibles, turn with me to Acts chapter 24. Acts chapter 24. Uh, again, for the way it's set up, uh, we need to try to cover that whole chapter today. Uh, so if you brought your lunch, you did a good thing today, all right? Because there's 27 verses, and uh, even Steve got me in early. I appreciate that, Steve. Uh, but we are going to attempt to get all of it done today. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed the study of Acts. Uh, we are coming down to the end of Acts. And so today I'd like to speak to you on the subject of Paul before Felix. Paul before Felix. Uh, this was his fourth trial, uh, and he still has more to go. And uh, let me give you the outline. If you have a bulletin you want to follow with us. Number one, the prosecution. The prosecution. Uh, today we'll literally be in a courtroom seeing what takes place in a courtroom. Number two, the defense. All right, Paul comes to his own defense. The, pro the prosecution, the defense. And number three, the verdict. The verdict. Listen, folks, there's always going to be a verdict. Okay, there's always a verdict. And I'm telling you, there must be a time of decision making. In this case, it was just one. It was Felix, uh, the governor there. And so here we'll see these three things. You know, Paul was quickly moved out of Jerusalem for his own safety. A huge army of 470 soldiers rushed him to Caesarea in the middle of the night because of another plot to kill Paul. They were taking Paul to the, to the governor, Felix, to hear the case that was against Paul, hoping he would get a fair trial. Like most governments during this time of history, corruptions and politics infected the system that made justice hard to come by. The old saying, who you know means more than what you know, still reigns true today. Matter of fact, in Lawton, Oklahoma, there was a lawyer there, and I won't call his name out because he's still there. If you were guilty and wanted to try to get off, you got this guy. But folks, the bottom line is God has the last say. God has the last say. The imperial Roman government only got involved if the local government couldn't solve the problem. In Acts 24, we see the local government system at work. This chapter also includes a tragic example of a missed opportunity on the part of Felix. So let's look in Acts chapter 24. Now, after five days, Ananias the high priest came down with the elders and a certain orator named Tertullius. And again, five days. You have to realize that is quick turnaround. It's a 65 uh, you know, mile journey, 65 miles. And so it's not easy to get there uh, overnight, but they were quickly doing this. My personal opinion was they didn't want him to get away. They wanted to make sure Felix was going to keep him arrested till they got there, hence the quick thing. And then and the elders were part of the Sanhedrin. Part of the Sanhedrin. And we know the Sanhedrin were Sadducees and Pharisees. But as any legal team would do, they would get people of those 70 on their side and that would say what they wanted them to say. All right? And a certain orator, they hired a lawyer. Now, folks, these people are serious here. All right? Up to this point, you know, it hasn't been uh, real serious as far as, you know, the judgment and things. You know, a lot of times, you know, it was, it was done out in front of everybody and, and, and the, the Jews really didn't have the last say in that. And you have to realize, folks, they would have already killed Paul if it wasn't for Claudius uh, stepping in and, and, and taking him uh, to Caesarea. These... The rest of that verse, these gave evidence to the governor against Paul. And when he was called upon, Tertullius began his accusation saying, seeing that through you we enjoy great peace and prosperity uh, is being brought to this nation by your foresight. And the nicest word I can put here is flattery. All right, a good lawyer wants the judge on their side. I mean, he is flattering uh, Felix basically saying, we're glad you're here. We know you're going to be fair and impartial. Verse 3, we accepted always in all places most noble Felix with all thankfulness. And folks, I'm telling you, Felix was not one of the best governors. 
all right? He, he had a lot of things in his personal life, all right? Extortion, uh, bribes. Uh, there was several things that he did uh, in his personal life which was not uh, in what we would call Christian standards. But the smart lawyer tried to sway uh, Felix automatically and quickly. Verse 4, nevertheless, not to be uh, tedious to you any further, I beg you to hear by our courtesy a few words from us. Now, folks, this is where he gets to lying, all right? All right? And I'm not saying all lawyers are liars. I'm not saying that. But I'm telling you, he was hired to do a job. And the chances of him doing it quickly were not well, okay? It, it, he wasn't there. He was there to say whatever he needed to say to win a case. And folks, a lot. And again, I'm not trying to lump lawyers in into one category. There are Christian lawyers. There are good Christian lawyers. And I praise God for that. But you can see as he starts out here, he is not telling the truth. And you will see that uh, in the verses that we're about to read. Look at verse 5. For we have found this man a plague. There were three charges they had against Paul. There was a personal charge, there was a political charge, and there was a doctrinal charge. Okay, three charges, personal, political, and doctrinal. So we see the first one. We found this man a plague. And folks, you have to understand what a plague is. You don't want plagues. All right? It's kind of like the, the ten plagues. I mean, you don't want locusts invading your, your, your town and things like that. So he's a pest, is what he is saying. A creator of dissension among, among all the Jews throughout the world. All right? Now, he's telling one of those big ones. All right? Even though he'd been on three mission trips, you cannot say the whole world listened to Paul. You cannot say he got him. Uh, you know, uh, you know he, he said some bad things, uh, you know, while he was out ministering and evangelizing. And folks, the bottom line is the Jews, these Jewish folks, these are the ones that really got on Jesus all the time. All right? Jesus called them hypocrites. All right? Jesus battled these, the, the Sanhedrin and the scribes and the Pharisees. And now it's Paul's turn. And so they are fabricating these accusations. And he is, he is well known, but not to the whole world. He is not stirring up everything. So that was the first thing. That was personal. And then the political part. He says, and a ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes. So now what is he saying? He is against the Roman government. Folks, he had no problem with the Roman government. I mean, I understand, I certainly don't agree with everything our government does. I don't, all right? I object. I vote Christian conscience. But here, he is basically saying, you know, he is the one, you know, uh, that, that is leading this revolt because, and here's what they're going to say later on, Jesus Christ, he says, is a king. And folks, Paul is just telling the truth. Jesus is our king, folks. He is our king. And sometimes it clashes with government. And Felix, uh, you know, was smart enough to, you know, figure some of this stuff out. He married a Jewish, uh, we talked about that. She had a Jewish background, Drusilla. And so he knew what was going on. I mean, he had already heard of Jesus Christ. So you weren't going to pull the wool over his eyes. But that is the most serious crime of that. He's basically saying he, Paul is trying to overthrow the Roman government, and that was not what was happening. Another one of his lies. And then number six, the third charge, verse six, the third charge, he even tried to profane the temple and seize him, and we wanted to judge him according to our law. And folks, the Roman law overrode the Jewish law. Okay, the Roman law was the government. They were the ones that would punish people. They were the ones that decided what would happen in cases like these. So this personal attack, this political attack, and this doctrinal attack, and the third one is when he went uh, with uh, the Nazarenes, and he went and, and he uh, uh, went to the temple and 
you know, did the sacrifice because he'd been in the Gentile world. They were accusing him of sedition there. And of course, that was not happening there. Verse 7, but the commander, Lysias, came and with great violence took him out of our hands. Do you see how that's just not the truth? The violence was from the mob. This commander saved Paul's life. So all the way through here, you see lie after lie after lie. The deck was stacked against Paul in the commanding uh, his accusers to come to you. By examining him yourself, you may ascertain all these things of which we accuse him. And the Jews also assented, maintaining that these things were so. So you see these charges against Paul, and you see uh, the prosecution accusing him of all these things that he had not done, not one of these things that he'd done. And he, according to them, broke the Roman law, broke the Jewish law, and broke God's law. And 1 Peter 1, go with me if you would, to 1 Peter 1. I want you to look at what Peter says about the law in government. 1 Peter 1, 13. Therefore submit yourselves to every ordinance of man for the sake, whether, the, whether to the king as supreme or to the governors as who are sent by him, for the punishment of evildoers and for the praise of those who do good. Now folks, you have to understand, we have to have laws. If there was no speed limit out in front of our church, which sometimes I'm not sure there is to some people, okay? They do not go 45 miles an hour out here. And if somebody is, you know, let's say on an interstate, and now they've moved it up to 75, and I've noticed when I've traveled on I-40, there are a lot of people not doing 75, they're doing more than 75. Why was that law written? To protect you. To protect you, to make it safe. All right, And that's what the laws of the land. And I know the argument, well, not all the laws protect us. Folks, it's still the law, okay? And policemen, we should not be afraid of our policemen. I understand all this going on, and I know there needs to be some police reform. I don't have a problem with that. But to lump them all in and saying they're all out to get us, folks, it's just not true. We need policemen. We need to respect Policemen, we need to pray for our policemen. The policemen up in Pea Ridge, literally someone was getting away and ran over a police officer. And that's who needs to fear, okay? That's who needs to be afraid of the system and the justice system. That's who needs to do that. Verse 15, for this is the will of God, that by doing good you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish men. And folks, there are people that just say silly things. And I understand what went on in, in the uh, George Floyd case. All right, the guy's going to prison. What he did, I watched it. It was wrong. He needed to be prosecuted. But it doesn't mean all policemen are bad. We still need to respect the officers of the law. Verse 16, as free yet not using liberty as a cloak for vice, but as bond servants of God. We represent Jesus Christ. And we don't need to be chewing people out. And uh, sometimes people write ugly, nasty letters, letters to an er editorial letters. Folks, be careful what you write. You can write without being nasty about it, is what I'm trying to say. Now here it is, verse 17. Honor all people. Folks, we need to honor everyone. Everyone, honor them. All right, our government officials, all right, we all vote and, and we live. We live in a democracy and we have to live with the vote that is given. We may not honor the person or even sometimes, you know, you know the corruption is there. There, there is some, you know, question there. We still need to honor the office according to the Word of God. Love the brotherhood. Fear God and honor the king. And folks, I am telling you, Paul had nothing to fear. Nothing to fear because he had done nothing 
wrong. And God uh, would protect him throughout this trial. So we see the prosecution. Let's look at the defense. The defense. Verse 10, Then Paul, after the governor had nodded uh, to him to speak, answered, In so much as I know that you have been uh, for many years a judge of this nation, I do the more cheerfully answer myself. All right, he didn't have a lawyer. Okay, he didn't have a lawyer. He didn't flatter, all right, Felix. He was just saying, thank you, I will represent myself. Because you may ascertain uh, that it is no more than 12 days since I went up to Jerusalem to worship. He went to Jerusalem to worship. All right, he wasn't trying to profane, profane the temple. All right? He wasn't. And it says, And they neither found me in the temple disputing with anyone nor inciting a crowd either in the synagogues or uh, the city. And up to this point when he came back, his whole, his whole idea for going to Jerusalem was to give an offering from the Gentile churches to the, the Jews that were being persecuted in Jerusalem. That's why he went in the first place. So even his motive was pure. His motive was right in what he had done. He even, if you, if you study it historically, he did not do much preaching at all in this time. Because what he was wanting to do, he was wanting to go to the top. All right? He was wanting to go to the top. And that's what he did earlier when he appealed to Caesar. Okay? He wanted to be in a court of law because you have a captive audience and all you're supposed to do when you get sworn in, you put your hand on the Bible. Do you promise to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? And Paul is saying, I'm telling you, God is my witness. This did not happen. Verse 13, nor can they prove the things of which you now accuse me. But this I confess to you, that according to the way which they call a sect, I uh, so I worship the God of my fathers, believing all things which are written in the law and the prophets. He's saying, I'm telling you, I believe the Old Testament and I believe the prophets. Okay? Abraham, the father of their faith, I believe everything he said. For instance, the Sadducees only uh, read Moses' law, the first five books of the law. And they based everything on the law. And folks, the law cannot save you. It is not possible. And Paul is saying the way, which was what they called Christians back then, that's who I represent. The leader of that sect, you crucified. You've already crucified him. But I'm telling you, and, and he will say this, I believe in Jesus Christ. And folks, there's where the problem arose with the Jews. They did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And they were doing everything in their powers to shut him up. That's what it's saying. Verse 15, I have hope in God, which they themselves also accept, that there will be a resurrection of the dead, both of the just and the unjust. And that was the problem when he said to the Jews, I am leaving the Jews and I'm going to minister to the Gentiles. Well, a Jew back then hated the Gentiles. There were still problems in hatred, in hatred and bigotry in that, that part and in that sect. And so he's basically saying, listen, I'll wipe my feet, I'll move on, and we're going on to the Gentiles. And that's when they went crazy. They went nuts. And this is the first time in any of Paul's preaching that he mentioned not only uh, both the just, talking about Christians, but the unjust also. So he was drawing a line in the sand. He was saying, I'm telling you, there's two kinds of people in this world. There are saved Christians, and there are lost people. Verse 16, this being so myself, I always strive to have a conscience without, without offense towards God and men. He said, I, I, let me make it clear, I didn't come here to offend anybody. I have come to this court of law to tell the truth, to tell the simple truth. Verse 17, now after many years I came to bring alms and offerings to my nation. He's just talking about historically I was gone many years. And a lot of things change, folks, when you go back to town, 
to a place you haven't been in a long time. In the midst of which some Jews from Asia found me purified in the temple, neither with a mob or tumult. So he even names them. He's saying, these are ones that have accused me. And his question is, where are they? You have to understand, folks, in a court of law, an eyewitness is the best thing that you can have on your side. These folks didn't even show up. They did not come, all right, with, with the high priest and with some of the Sanhedrin. Verse 19, they ought to have been here before you to object if they had anything against me, or else those who are here themselves say if they found any wrongdoing in me while I stood before the council. So he's simply pointing out to Felix, Felix, this is an open and shut case. They're accusing me, and basically it's my word against them. But of, the, of this third crime, I'm just telling you, where are these Asian Jews? Why aren't they in this court of law? And he knew enough. Folks, Paul was smart. He was an intelligent man. He was well-versed, not only in the Word of God, but with the Jewish laws and the Roman laws. Verse 21, unless it is for this one statement, which I crowd out standing among them, concerning the resurrection of the dead, I am being judged by, by you this day. See, the case was really not a civil case, folks. It was a theological case. It was what you truly believe. Paul believed in the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And folks, I'm telling you, there are third world countries, as Betty said earlier, that I'm telling you, if you are a Christian, you cannot publicly say the name of Jesus. You cannot carry a copy of the Word of God with you. And all Paul is saying is, we shouldn't even be in this place. This, this, is, this is not where it should have been. This is a civil court against the Roman law, and, and I have broken no Roman laws. And you know he's well-versed, all right? The book of Romans, can I help you here? He knew what was going on. Romans 1, go with me while I mention that. Romans 1. Look at Romans 1, verse 16. Here's what he was truly saying by that last statement. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul wasn't ashamed. Paul was strong in his belief. Paul stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the government. Uh, st Paul stood toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Sanhedrin and the high priest. And he's simply saying, you're not going to shut me up. You're not going to tell me what I can say and I cannot say. All right? Folks, we believe in freedoms. One of the freedoms, and I'll, I'll be talking about this next week, is the freedom of speech. I have the right to preach. I can go down on garrison and preach if I choose, as long as I don't cause a disturbance. And Paul's simply saying, hey, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and for also the Greek. Folks, salvation is for everyone. Everyone. Verse 17, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. It is written, the just shall live by faith. What is he quoting? Folks, he's quoting the Old Testament, Habakkuk 2.4, if you want to look up the reference. He is simply saying the issue, folks, is faith. Felix, the issue is not Roman law. It's what you believe. And listen to me, church. What you believe is extremely important. See, there's even a phrase I don't even like to use. Casual Christian. Folks, I don't think we can be casual Christians. I think God calls us to a higher standard. I don't want to be a casual Christian. Christian. I want to be a Christian in love with God, in love with Jesus Christ, so that everywhere I go, I could walk in a room and I don't have to say a word and they'll know there's something different about me. I want to be a Christian on fire, on fire for the Lord. And folks, if you look in the Bible, he is one of the most uh, bold uh, God 
spirit-filled Christians that walk the face of this earth. And he's saying it's a theological problem, not a Roman problem. So we see the prosecution. We see Paul in his own defense. And let me let, me let you see the verdict. The verdict. Look at, chapter, look at verse 22. But when Felix heard these things, having more accurate knowledge of the way, he adjourned the proceedings and said, when, Ly- when Lysus, uh, the commander, comes down, I will make the decision uh, on your case. So what happened? He heard. He knew exactly who the way was. He understood everything Paul was saying. And it's a case of he said, she said. Okay, or he said, he said. All right, so he's just saying, I got the letter. And folks, he'd already read the letter from the commander. And the commander says, I, had, I heard it. I didn't understand. I, I, I didn't see that there was any reason uh, to, to kill him. Uh, you know, the mob attacked him. He read that, and he's just saying, I've got to talk to this guy. So he literally put the case on hold. Now, verse 23, so he commanded the centurion to keep Paul and to let him have liberty and told him uh, not to forbid any of his friends to provide or provide for or visit him. So what had happened? Well, I think it's obvious, all right, these Jews lost their case. I mean, they came down to try him, and the best hope was that they would just send them back to Jerusalem And if he sent them back to Jerusalem, I'm telling you, folks, he would have never come out of there alive. But God intervened on Paul's behalf. God wasn't through with Paul yet. Listen, folks, you are under the divine protection of God. Nothing's going to happen to you. Nothing uh, catches God by surprise. He is our commander. He is our lawyer. He is our judge also, almighty God. So he said, you know what? I'm not going to put you in the common jail. You just stay here in the palace. You just hang out here. All right, your friends can come and go. If you need something, they can come and go. So obviously Paul won the trial. He won the trial. Verse 24, and after some days, when Felix came with his wife, Drusilla, who was Jewish, He sent for Paul and heard him concerning the faith in Christ. What did all that do? It made Felix and his wife curious. Curious. Folks, the world is curious about Christians. They really are. They want to know, why do you go to church every Sunday? Why do you put money in that plate? Why do you witness? Why why are you knocking on doors? Why do you care so deeply about people you don't even know? Why are all these things going on? And and just Paul being there intrigued him and his wife. And he thought, hey, while he's here, let's talk to this guy. Let's find out what makes this guy tick. And then verse 25 says, And as he reasoned about righteousness, self-control, and judgment to come, Felix was afraid. What did Paul do? Folks, Paul didn't give him a sermonette, okay? Paul wasn't tickling his ears. Paul didn't hold back, folks. The truth of the Word will always be the truth of the Word. The Bible is our our lifeline, folks. The Bible is our guideline. We do what the Bible says. The Bible, the Word of God. And, And Paul, I'm sure, said, thus saith the Lord. And he pointed out three things he knew about Felix and his wife. One was righteousness. Okay? You have to be righteous before God. Folks, I'm telling you, your, your own righteousness, you being a good person, is not going to get you into heaven. Okay? You knowing somebody, hey, your daddy may have been a deacon and a, or a preacher even, but that don't mean that you're going to heaven. Matter of fact, the preacher's kids sometimes have a reputation to be some of the worst kids. And folks, that's not always in the case, okay? Not always. But he was saying, you've got to come God's way. When you come to God in salvation, you've got to come. You have to understand, he was a governor. 
He ruled over a lot of people. He had a lot of money. There was corruption, corruption in what he did. And so he called his hand. Really, he just basically said, hey, you're a sinner, and you need God's grace, is what he told him. The second thing is self-control. Okay, self-control, which he proved in his lifestyle that he had none. Okay, he did what he wanted when he wanted to do it. And he just, as a governor, just snapped, and he made things happen. But there was corruption there. And then the third thing he mentioned was judgment to come. And this is where, I'm telling you, Felix's whole countenance changed. See, I've even witnessed the people that have told me this. I don't believe in heaven, and I don't believe in hell. I don't believe in either one. Well, folks, I got news for you. Whether you believe it or not, it's going to happen. Why? Because the Word of God says hell is real. The Bible tells us we all must stand before the judgment seat of Christ. I don't care whether you're a Christian or a non-Christian. You are going to stand before God, and you are going to give an account to God in, in your life to God. And so when he started talking about judgment, Felix was afraid. What is afraid? Folks, i tell you what really happened in my mind. He got under Heavy conviction. Heavy conviction. Paul struck a nerve. Because I don't care how much money you have, I don't care how many things you have, it will not get you into heaven. You cannot buy your way into heaven. And so Felix, I, I believe he started trembling. I believe literally. And folks, there's people that, during invitation time, they just grab the back of the chair and they hold on. They know God is speaking to them, but they are not coming down because they would have to change. Then Felix was afraid and answered, go away for now. <laughs> Can you believe, what is he saying? Man, just get out of here. Get out of here. I, I don't like what you're saying. It makes me feel bad. All right? It's making me convicted. But Paul, I'm telling you, spoke the truth to Felix. Now here's the, here's the line that gets me. When I have a convenient time, I will call for you. Well, my question is, when is it going to be convenient, folks? What is he saying? Not right now. And here's how the world lives. And I've even heard this when I've witnessed. Well, I'm going to live my whole life. I'm going to do what I do. And where I... When I hear that trumpet sound, I'm going to fall on my face and I'm going to ask the Lord to come into my life and I'm going to ask Him to save me. And I said, okay, I understand that. But let me show you a scripture that says He will come in the twinkling of an eye. How are you going to do that in one one-hundredth of a second? See, judgment is real, folks. In a lot of people, do not believe. They choose not to believe. And sometimes even in witnessing, they say, you don't have anything to stand on, stand on because I don't believe the Bible. Folks, the Bible's true. All right? The Bible's true. And he, he said a more convenient time. Verse 26, Meanwhile, he also hoped that money would be given to him by Paul that he might be released. Why did he keep him for two years? He thought, well, maybe Paul will get tired of staying you know, in, in, in uh, the palace and just Give me a bribe. Give me some money. Then I, that would prove that, hey, he, he is not who he says he is. Therefore, he sent, him for a more, sent for him more often and conversed with him. How could that be, folks? How could you keep talking to a man like Paul? I'm telling you what it is, folks. It's a hardened heart. A hardened heart. You've said no to God so many times, you're not even under conviction anymore. And folks, that's a scary place to be. That is a scary place to be. Verse 27, but after two years, Festus succeeded Felix, and Felix, wanting to do the Jews a favor, left Paul down. Left Paul bound. Hebrews 10, I close with this. Hebrews 10. Sobering scripture here. Hebrews 10. Verse 26, for if we willfully sin after we have received the knowledge of truth, there's no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins. Folks, we are saved, but we don't need to be a disgrace to grace. 
We don't need to be a disgrace to grace. I'm wondering today if you were in a court of law and they were going to try you for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? That's a sobering thought, folks. That's what this verse talks about. Verse 27, but a certain fearful expectation of judgment and fiery indignation will devour the adversaries. All right? Basically, it's saying the truth is going to come out. All right? Folks, you're either going to heaven or you're going to hell. Either you're saved or you're lost. Okay? And hell is real. It's a real place, folks. Verse 28, anyone who has rejected uh, Moses' law dies without mercy on the testimony of two or three witnesses. And again, that's where the Sadducees thought. They just stopped at the law. What was the law given for? So that we know when we would break a commandment of God. There is a purpose in the law. But Jesus came. Jesus came. And his life, uh, you know, uh, his death, his blood paid for our sins. Verse 29, of how much worse punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy to those who have trampled the Son of God underfoot? We're talking about the lost. Rejection. Rejecting Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Counted the blood in the covenant by which he was sanctified by a common thing and insulted the Spirit of grace. That's where I say again, we cannot be a disgrace to grace. People are watching us in everything we do. Verse 30, for we know him who said, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Folks, God has a last say, and the Lord will judge his people. Now here's the verse, and this is what made me think of Felix. It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. What would make it fearful for your life? Not knowing where you're going for sure. Not knowing, not being 100% sure that if you were to die today, you would go to heaven. That is a fearful thing. And do you know to the Christian, what would be a fearful thing to the Christian? Knowing you're not right with God. Knowing that in your heart of hearts. You know what Felix did? Felix says, go away. Get away from here, Holy Spirit. Leave me alone. I'm not dealing with this today. And folks, the Bible tells us today can be your day of salvation. God is waiting for you to say yes. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for the word. And God, I pray we would not be like Felix. God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, God, I pray they would trust you as their Savior and Lord. And God, I pray for the Christian. God, I pray that, uh, Lord, that they are living for you and living for Jesus Christ. I pray that their testimony is one of being saved. And God, they want to follow your laws and they want to follow you and they want to be more like Jesus. And God, I pray if there's one here today that needs to rededicate their life or follow the Lord in baptism, or even join the church. God, we know the truth of your word. So God, it's your invitation. It is your time. Thank you for Paul's life. Thank you for Paul being truthful. And God, I pray that we would not lie to ourselves today. Lord, help us to tell the truth. Help us to be that man and that woman in the mirror that God is looking at us. And God, I pray that if we need to change something, we'll do it today. And God, we'll be careful to give you the honor and the glory. In Jesus' name I pray, amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has spoken to you in any way, would you come?